Good morning. My name is Lawrence Chow, and uh, I'd like to share with you this morning um, our experience with OCT-based IOL calculations in our practice in post-laser uh, vision correction eyes. I am a consultant for OptoView, and I receive speaker fees, and I have no other financial interests in any of the projects, uh, any of the products mentioned here. Um, I wonder if there are any ichthyologists or fishermen, fisherwomen in the room, but does everyone know what type of fish this is? Everyone's so interested in if they're getting conned at their favorite seafood restaurant and really getting real fish. Any guesses? This is the most common type of herring found in North America. It's the Atlantic herring. And my point is simply is that our practice, the face of it has really changed in the past five years. Where a patient like this used to be a red herring, this is a very common patient that comes in every week. We have a 67-year-old man with visually significant cataracts. He had LASIK about a dozen years ago, and he had an enhancement, he thinks, a year or two after that. And uh, now he has BPH and he's on Flomax. He basically uh, expects fantastic vision because he's had LASIK before and he understands what seeing that golf ball landing looks like. And his friends at the golf club tell him that the crystal lens is the best lens for him. And of course, we cannot find old medical records. We've asked the patient to look himself, and we've looked. But the patient does at least know that he had myopic LASIK, and as a result, he wants the same result. So what we're really seeing now is a surge of patients past 65. AARP estimates that about 8,000 patients are turning 65 every single day, and some estimates go as high as 10,000 patients. So if we look at the patient-provider ratio, there's about 81 ophthalmologists, and that includes ophthalmologists in training as well as practicing ophthalmologists in the United States for every 1 million patients. Now, I know that distribution is probably skewed more to more urban areas, but still, uh, that's the statistics that the International Council of Ophthalmology gave us in 2012. We're not exactly sure how many millions of people in the United States have had laser vision correction, but how many of those patients really have old medical records? Part of the issue that we're having is that patients are really coming in with what I call exacting expectations. And part of that is because they've experienced laser vision correction. They've experienced the wow factor of day one, and they remember how great their vision was. So there are greater expectations from this technology, and patients are more willing than ever to pay for this technology. On top of it, as patients talk to their friends that are about the same age, they're talking to them about their presbyopic ILL experience, and now people are asking more and more about laser femtosecond-based cataract surgery as well. It's interesting, I was paging through the OSN Ocular Surgery News about two weeks ago, and um, I believe this was an article from Mitch Jackson out of the practice management section, but I thought this was a very interesting factoid. A 10-year study conducted by OMIC, Ophthalmic Mutual Insurance Company, revealed that IOL power calculations represent the single largest malpractice risk to a practicing ophthalmologist. Well, with that being said, I think all of us have gotten what we call a post-refractive surprise. Someone who's had LASIK before, we do our best to calculate, and they turn out slightly hyperopic. Why is this? Well, Doyle talked about this, but there are really two reasons. Number one is the way we measure the corneal curvature, usually by keratometry, is really inaccurate. We're changing the anterior, cornea, uh, the anterior corneal curvature, but we're not changing the posterior curvature. So the relationship has really changed, and we're not getting a true corneal power. The second factor that plays into this is that there is a distinct relationship in a lot of the IOL formulas that actually put a proportion to the anterior to the posterior segments. So if you have a low central corneal power, a flat cornea, and um, after LASIK, you really have an incorrect assumption that your anterior chamber is shallow. And we're beginning to see devices and formulas that actually help us decipher this. This is why, for example, the lens star actually measures lens thickness, and this begins the whole discussion of effective lens position. 
Now, there are several methodologies for post-laser vision correction calculations, and probably the most common and the most cumbersome one is the clinical history method. Um, obviously, if we can get old medical records, that's half the battle. The other battle is actually being Sherlock Holmes and actually siphoning through these records, finding out old keratometry readings and preoperative refractions. Not an easy job when we're talking about handwritten medical records. Hopefully, electronic health records will help us with this. There's also, uh, for those of you that are good contact lens fitters or that have optometrists working with them, the RGP overfit method is quite good, but this is limited by if a patient has a really severe cataract, how good can you get the acuity? Now, we do have a lot of IO formulas needing historical information. Dr. Aaron Berry published his double K adjustment, and we can put that adjustment into existing formulas such as the Hoffer, the Holiday, the SRKT, and that works well, but again, you need some historical information. There are some regression formulas for IOL formulas not needing historical information, such as the Shamus, the Hagus L, the Wong Koch Maloney. And forgive me, if I don't mention all of these, Warren Hill really has pioneered this field. And if you look on the Ascris website or on Dr. Hill's website, you'll get a real thorough discussion of all these formulas and when and how to use them. Well, there's some other methods for actually counting, calculating post-laser vision correction IOL power. And uh, the orb scan has been around for quite some while, and its claim to fame was the posterior float. But you also can get a total optical power from the orb scan. There's also shine flume photography. Using the Oculus Pentacam, we can get something called the EKR, or the equivalent corneal reading. And also, the OptoView RTVOCT actually has a resolution of down to about five microns. Pretty incredible, considering a red blood cell is about, what, 7.5 microns in diameter, I think? But uh, we can actually calculate powers with this now. So we owe a lot of this credit to David Wong, who's one of the inventors of OCT, and his research team at KCI up in Oregon. He developed a lab, he started a lab called the COOL Lab, which stands for the Center of Ophthalmic Optics and Lasers. And they pioneered this work to measure both the anterior and posterior corneal curvatures to give a total corneal power. And I think this was proved somewhere around November of um, 2011. These numbers are then entered onto a free online formula at coolab.net to obtain an IOL power. Now, you cannot use the OCT, the RTV, by itself. You still need another source of information from either an IOL master or a lens star. You do need an axial length, and you also do need an anterior chamber depth. So you're working off another machine as well. You do need to know whether your patient has had hyperopic surgery or myopic surgery, and this does not work for virgin eyes or for incisional refractive surgery, such as RK. So the RT view actually obtains a net corneal power by looking at the anterior and posterior powers, and it obtains a central corneal thickness. How we do this in our office is on the first consultation for cataract, we um, verify a, a history of laser vision correction, and we perform a pachymetry, a topography, and at that very time, we actually give a patient a medical release form to try to obtain those old medical records. This seems to be the most uh, delaying part of this whole process. And we do the OCT measurements for corneal power. On the second exam, when they come back for IOL measurement, we'll actually do um, an IOL master and or lens star. And uh, we'll also try to review those old records if they're available. Now, we always do compare the OCT cool calculation with the historical method with the old records. And for those of you who have done that, I think you'll realize that is a huge time sink. That's not something you really can do in the midst of your day when you're seeing a very busy clinic. That's something you're usually doing after clinic or on the weekends. So having this cool calculation available has really um, saved a lot of time in us looking at old medical records. If we do not have any historical information, we use a regression formula like the Hagus L or, um, or the Holiday, uh, Holiday 2 formula. 
this is a little small, I'm sorry, but um, ideally this is what the Excel spreadsheet kind of looks like. And what they want here is a patient name, which eye, what type of laser vision correction was done. Um, we want to look at the IOL master, or excuse me, the IOL model and the A constant and what our target refraction is. This is for anterior chamber depth and axial length. And what we're doing is we're doing two measurements and averaging those measurements to enter data into the cool calculation. And it spits out a very nice number for your IOL power once you determine which lens you want to use. So this is a real patient. This is a 64-year-old man that had prior myopic LASIK seven years ago. And he represents, presents with um, pretty dense cataracts. Um, he was set for monovision on his primary LASIK. And then he vaguely tells us that he had an enhancement done a year or two later. Doesn't really remember. He does remember having an RD in the left eye fixed by laser about 10 years ago. And there are no old records for him. So his best corrected acuity in the right is 2070. On his left is 2060. And his um, refraction is about a minus three sphere on the right, minus 350 with about 225 of sill on the left. His Ks are rather flat. And looking at his axial length, we were able to do an IOL master and get 26.35 millimeters on the right. And we were not able to image him on the left eye, so we did an immersion and we got 26.39. And if we had forgotten that this patient had LASIK before, and we just used a regular IOL calculation, we would have actually, for example, used the monofocal on his right eye. And based on SRKT, we would have used the 15.5 diopter lens, which estimates his post-refractive power to be about 0.2 diopters minus. On the cool calculation, we got quite a different number, 17.44, and we rounded up to 17.5 diopters. On his left eye, we used the toric IOL. And again, if we had totally ignored the fact they had LASIK, we would have gotten a 15 diopter toric lens. Instead, with the cool calculation, we rounded up to 16 diopters. On month one, spherical equivalent on his right eye, we got about 0.12. Um, and on his left eye, minus 0.38. Not only is the patient quite happy, but uh, we were very happy to give him this result as well. You know, our experience with the uh, cool calculations obviously is limited. I do not have a very uh, robust cataract practice. We're busy, but uh, we need more eyes. And hopefully we'll get uh, a lot of you in this room using this technology. We looked at uh, 25 patients that had post-laser vision correction cataract surgery, and we took 29 eyes out of these 25 patients, and we excluded all the patients with pathologies, with keratoconus, with Fuchs dystrophy, with a macular hole, with uh, epiretinal membrane. And we looked at these 29 eyes, and we did a little um, comparison. I was actually kind of surprised to find that 56% of these 25 patients had no old records available whatsoever, while 44% did. I thought that actually would be a little higher. All this was done by myself, and we've only used three lenses. We used the monofocal, an aspheric toric, as well as a crystal lens. So if we look at a visual acuity uh, plot here in this bell curve, um, these are our one month uncorrected visual acuities. And the green is representing it for a uh, crystal lens. The orange is the aspheric toric and the blue is the uh, monofocal SN60WF. If we specifically look at the spherical equivalence at one month, uncorrected, uh, out of 29 eyes, our mean average error was 0.55 diopters, which correlates pretty well to Dr. Tang's work um, that was shown earlier. 58% um, of eyes were within half a diopter, 86% of eyes were within a diopter, and 100% of eyes were within a diopter and a half. So very clearly, I think that there are many benefits of doing cool calculations. Um, aside from providing a direct measurement of corneal power, you know, imaging is very quick and simple for myself or for my technicians to perform, and it really flows well into um, our clinic workflow. Um, that time sink of locating old medical records is still there, 
But I'm noticing I am spending a lot less time going through old records and searching for information when I'm able to get this information via the OCT. Um, I think we're really offering the latest technology to a very demanding population of patients. And one of the great things is that the cool calculator is free as a formula online. I know you may be saying to yourself, but I need an OCT view. Well, I have actually a lot of colleagues in the area sending me their post-refractive patients for calculations. So this has worked out really well. Um, I think we're on time. I think that's it for now. Okay. Thank you.